Hey guys, what's going on? This is John from Friends Your Benefits. Fall is almost here, and while that means pumpkin spice lattes will be returning, unfortunately for many people, it means that their student loan payment plans will be kicking in again for the first time since March of 2020. Joining us today to learn more about that and what people can do with student loan payment plans, we have Anna Karras, a financial advisor at Centennial Wealth. Hey, Anna, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Hey, John, thanks for having me. Of course. So, Anna, before we get started, I think it's always important for our audience to get to know you a little bit better, right? So can you tell our audience maybe one, two fun facts about yourself and what you enjoy most about financial planning? Sure. Uh, I'm a, you know, as you said, I'm a financial advisor with Centennial Wealth Management. I'm in the Columbia, Maryland area with my husband and our cat. Um, we've been married since February of this year, and we're getting ready to go on our honeymoon next month. Uh, we're going to spend a couple of days in Ireland, Munich for Oktoberfest, and then we're going to go to Croatia. Awesome. Definitely a lot of fun right there. Yeah. <laughs> So let's go right into it, right? So as you heard me mention, student loan repayments are going to start in the fall. So what, tell me a little bit more about this, right? So why are student loan repayments starting in the fall? And really, what can people do to prepare? So student loans, as you mentioned, have been paused since about March of 2020. Um, it was one of the very early steps that was put into place by the Biden administration to start to deal with some of the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it was one thing that the government could control at the time that would put some money back into people's pockets. And that pause has extended for three and a half years at this point. And there have been a couple of stops and starts with things like forgiveness and starting payments, but it looks like at this point, they're pretty serious about payments actually starting. We actually have dates and, and things like that at this point. So it, it is about time for people to start getting ready, unfortunately. So what can people actually do to get ready? I mean, should they really take a look at their budget? What do you recommend? Like if you're talking to a new client and they said, hey, Anna, I have a ton of student loan debt, right? And here's this payment that I may have to make, maybe starting September, October, what have you. What should I really do? So first step is going to have to be to log into the actual student loan website. Uh, I'm guessing there are more than one person watching this who probably doesn't even remember their password at this point. <laughs> so going through that process of logging back in is going to be important and refamiliarizing with your, yourself with your loans and your interest rates and your payment options, especially, um, you know, different repayment programs have, you know, come out in the last couple of years and people's eligibility for different programs has also probably changed. So this is a really good time to, you know, explore your options in terms of, you know, income driven or income contingent payment plans, public uh, service loan forgiveness plans, different things like like that. And, you know, also start to figure out what your payments are going to be. And if you can start setting that money aside every month into savings, uh, you know, we don't have that much time before student loans are going to start again. But if you know that your monthly payment is going to be 150 bucks a month, uh, I think you'll probably be better served to just go ahead and start putting that 150 a month now in August aside, you know, put it into your savings account. It'll add a little bit of buffer to your savings account. Plus it'll also get you used to not spending that money. Would it make sense for anyone to make an early payment? You know, we're in August now. Would it make sense to just, I guess, pay a principal payment or would you still recommend just putting the money in savings and then waiting until the actual due date? I think that's going to depend on your personal financial situation. Uh, if you have a fully funded emergency fund and, you know, the rest of your finances are kind of ticking along in the background, then I don't think it can hurt to make a principal payment, um, especially given that interest does actually start in September. You know, September 1st is the day that interest starts accruing. So making a payment in the months of September after interest has started is, is not the worst idea in the world. Uh, payments are meant to start again in October, and that's when people's statements are probably going to start coming back out again. So if you can, you know, if the rest of your money is is doing fine, then it's not the worst idea in the world. But my guess is that a lot of people who had the means to do that probably would have been doing it by now. Fair enough. So one thing that was popular a few years ago prior to COVID was student loan, I guess, refinancing plans, right, where you could potentially get a private loan at a lower interest rate. My guess is, given our rising interest rate environment, it probably doesn't make sense to do that. But hey, you're the expert, so why don't you tell our audience your perspective on that? 
My guess is that a lower interest rate in a private loan is going to be kind of hard to come by at this point. Uh, you know, we're talking about federal student loans here. You know, federal student loans were the ones that were paused. So, uh, and those generally do have lower interest rates than private ones. Generally, not always. There's, you know, I've seen some some six and a half and seven percent unsubsidized loans from federal loans. So I've seen it. I have, but in general, they do tend to have the lower interest rates. So if you can find a lower interest rate for a private loan, uh, you know, maybe your your credit score has gone up substantially since when you first took out your loan and you did have one of those higher loans and it does work out, then that that might make some sense for you. Um, again, the the downside of moving from public to private loans is that in a lot of cases, the you know, the payment plans aren't quite as forgiving because now you're dealing with a private company instead of the government. Um, you know, you, your your eligibility for a lot of these programs might go away. So it's something to, to keep in consideration. Um, but ultimately, for a lot of people, interest is going to be a really big factor because of the timeline it's going to take a lot of people to pay off their loans fully. Sure. Fair enough. So one thing I wanted to touch base to you on. So when the Secure 2.0 Act was passed, there was a provision in there, right? And in the past, many people who have had student loan debt they have said, hey, I might not be able to contribute to a 401k because I got to pay this debt off, right? And employers have been scratching their head and saying, what can we possibly do? And one of the provisions out there is it actually allows employers. So I guess uh, in layman's terms, if an employee out there is actually putting money into student loan repayments, and I guess somehow if they could prove it, then the employer can still make a match to the 401k. So and I really just want your perspective. Is that something that you think employers should really look at for 2024 and beyond? I do. I think that especially given the current labor market, you know, the the jobs report actually just came out today and you know there were 187,000 new jobs in in July or something like that. Um, but if you, you know, if you follow the news in any way, shape or form, you'll know that the job market is pretty competitive, as is the market for labor. So there are going to be a lot of companies who are going to be competing for the same pool of talent, you know, especially with in places like, you know, tech or legal or medical, uh, you know, nurses or something like that. There are going to be employers who are going to be competing for the same pool of talent. And I think that, you know, any way an employer can set themselves above and beyond their competition is going to help them in that race for talent. You know, as much as it's the right thing to do to help your employee, personal opinion, um, I think that it's if you can say that you're doing this and your competitor isn't, it'll probably give you a leg up over, you know, when it comes to getting those, that top talent. Fair enough. So let's take a break from student loans for a second. So outside of student loans, right? And you've definitely talked to a lot of people along the way, seen a lot of uh, interesting individuals out there as well. What's a top money mistake that you see millennials making out there? The biggest mistake I think people make is just not starting. Um, I think there's a variety of reasons. You know, there was the trend that happened on TikTok a, a couple of months ago where it was like, you know, I... Uh, I'll always have time to make more money, but I'll never be 25 in, in Italy ever again. <laughs> and while I agree with, you know, experiencing life and not waiting for retirement to do the things that are going to make you happy, uh, I also think that there needs to be a balance between those things. Uh, you know, while you'll always have time to make more money, the money that you invest in your 20s is going to probably be more valuable than the money you invest when you're in your 40s and just getting serious about it. Uh, you know, the, the time that that money has to grow is going to be your best friend in the world. And ultimately, you're going to have to invest less to get the same results when you start younger. So that's probably the biggest mistake I see. Um, and the other, then there are just kind of the other classic ones, you know, falling down the credit card, you know, rabbit hole is mm -hmm. as much as we, we all know that, uh, you know, carrying credit card debt is bad. Every once in a while, you just kind of get into that situation and it can be a really vicious cycle, especially now in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, credit card interest rate is usually prime, which is, you know, a base interest rate for the very best borrowers, which is probably somewhere around like 12 or 14 percent for high interest debt right now, uh, plus a certain percentage. So that, you know, prime can fluctuate and that other certain percentage can fluctuate. So there are credit cards being issued right now with 27, 28, 29 percent interest rates. Wow. And it's going to be really hard to pay that off if you get a high enough balance on there. So, you know, my recommendation for anyone who is going to pay, the, you know, play the credit cards game, because I like points as much as the next person. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Uh, is going to sure. be to make sure that you have that fully funded emergency fund uh, so that if something does come up, you're not 
stuck with putting it on the credit card and make sure that you're paying off your credit cards, uh, you know, as quickly as possible. Personally, I pay mine on Saturdays. There you go. And I've seen different strategies out there, right? I've seen people actually pay their credit cards weekly. Other people pay it oh, yeah. monthly. I mean, anything you recommend if you realize, holy cow, like I've actually racked up too many charges on my credit card. I so I, I personally like to do it weekly just because, uh, you know, most of most of my I have a monthly budget. And then if I spend a yep. little bit more of it in one week, then I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Then I should probably uh, calm down a little bit this next week. So it, it feel it gives me a little bit more of a feeling of control and kind of helps me keep that, you know, real time barometer of what I've been up to. So, Anna, let's say there's someone out there, right, and they want to hear a little bit more about your financial advising services or perhaps they want to connect with you directly. Where can they go? So the place that most people are going to find me, I think it's where you found me, is uh, on LinkedIn. I'm uh, just Anna Karras on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Anna Karras on LinkedIn, so it's not that hard of a thing to find. Um, don't be thrown off when you see Ameriprise Financial Services on my profile. Centennial is a franchise of Ameriprise. I did have to practice saying that. It is a little bit of a tongue twister. So, um, you know, don't be thrown off. That's me. Hit the follow button. Uh, you'll also find all of my contact information there. If you're looking to reach out to me directly, it'll just be, you know, over email probably. So that'll be anna.karis at ampf.com. Anna, thank you so much for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. It was a great talk. Absolutely. And for our audience out there, we want to hear from you guys. For those of you who happen to be having new student loan payment plans that are due in the fall, how are you going to tackle it? Comment below.